So hello, everyone. Thank you all for coming out. Um, I, we are very happy to have Justin Fox here today in the office to talk about his new book, The Myth of the Rational Market. Uh, this is Justin's first book, but he has been a blogger and contributor to the Times Magazine blog for since 2007. And before that, he worked for Fortune Magazine for over a decade. So we are very excited to have him here in the office today. So everyone, please welcome Justin Fox. And it, it looks like I'm going to have to stay close to this mic, so I'll, I'll like lean on the podium. I don't know. Um, I thought what I should do is, is start with a story that goes back to my when I was first starting out at Fortune magazine that kind of explains why I ended up writing this book and why it, I think it matters. And luckily, a financial crisis happened to make lots of other people think it matters too. But I was writing this book long before, before that came along. What, what it was is I, I had just gotten to Fortune. I hadn't been a business journalist before. I'd just been sort of a general interest business writer. But somehow ended up covering the intersection between corporations and financial markets, corporations and Wall Street. And one of the first big stories I wrote for the magazine was about the whole weird practice of managing earnings and managing Wall Street's consensus earnings forecast and trying to beat the consensus by a penny. And this whole dance that developed really in the early to mid 90s. And I mean, actually, the founders of this company made a really big deal about not wanting to participate in that dance. But that was later. So this was 1997. And it was very clear that there was huge amounts of effort at the CFO level, CEO level, put into making sure that you beat the consensus earning targets of all the Wall Street analysts by at least a penny or two. And as I was, so I documented this, talked to people about why they did it, and I thought it'd be interesting to look at the academic literature on this whole phenomenon. It turned out there were lots of papers by accounting professors explaining that, yes, there was lots of evidence that companies did weird things in order to make their quarterly earnings, first of all, come out smoothly rising over time, but second of all, to, to meet these consensus targets. But then there was this really weird thing about all of this accounting literature is when they went around to try to explain why, they came up with kind of weird things like maybe it had something to do with their bonus structure or maybe it was some debt covenant. But they basically weren't allowed to talk about the sort of most obvious reason why all the CEOs thought they were managing their earnings, which was to affect their stock price. And the reason for that was because if you were had a PhD and got a PhD in accounting in the last 25, 30 years, you were taught, because accounting is sort of this taught as this subset of academic finance, you were taught that you couldn't fool the market. That as a as a corporate executive, you couldn't, I mean, unless you were outright lying, but if you're using relatively transparent things like just shoving earnings into one quarter instead of the next, that, that people can see through, that that should have absolutely no impact on stock price, and therefore that can't be why anybody was doing it. And I remember that struck me as a little strange at the time. I ended up writing the article just saying, well, maybe all these CEOs and CFOs are crazy to be doing this, and kind of left it at that. And, and I came across a couple of similar conflicts between what everybody in corporate world believed and what all these lessons out of academic finance and accounting were. Another was about stock options accounting, which was a big controversial thing in the late 90s. Basically, all the accountants thought it should be accounted for as an expense. Everybody in Silicon Valley said that would be a disaster because the feeling was somehow it would cause all the stock prices of Silicon Valley companies to collapse. That was one, that was the bad reason. The better reason was it, was it would just cause executives to give out fewer of them. So did a lot of that writing, was sort of puzzled by this lack of interest in academia and in the, in, the, in the thought that maybe markets weren't always able to see through everything. Went away, went to London, was Fortune's Europe guy for a couple of years, came back and was in the office in New York in 2002 and just happened to pick up this book by a Caltech economist specialized in finance, where just sort of leafing through, I realized he was saying that actually he didn't believe anymore that, that markets could see, every, see through everything and were perfectly efficient. And very quickly, I, I, as I started looking through, I realized right around when I'd written that first article for Fortune in 97, there'd been this big shift in academic finance. There were lots of people questioning whether something like the tech stock bubble of 1999 and 2000 could be explained by anything other than just people going a bit nuts. And that struck me as a good idea for an article. Wrote an article for Fortune called, I think it was called, 
is the market rational, but you no, know, but neither are you, so don't think you can beat it. It was very investing focused because it was for our investor guide. And then that led to this book. Some guy from a publisher, Harper Collins, came and said I should write a book about that. And nobody had ever, from a reputable publisher, had ever asked me to do that before. And so I said yes, which is something I regretted greatly over many of the last five or six years. But it's okay now. Um, and what I, so what I thought is I, I don't want to write this polemic. I, I just want to write this story of why did all these accounting professors and finance professors and a lot of economists come to believe that that financial markets, the stock market in particular, were so smart and able to see through everything and not subject to bubbles and everything else. And the story I came up with is it was this combination of things. I mean, there's certain elements have been there in economics forever because there's certain elements of truth to it. Markets are smart. They react to things. They can see through people's nonsense sometimes. And the, the whole idea of Adam Smith's invisible hand of market forces moving things in a relatively positive direction without, because of the actions of lots of selfish people looking out for themselves. That's been around forever. But what, what developed after World War II was this combination of, first it was the rise of statistics and mathematical modeling, not just in economics, but all over corporate America. And a lot of that, I mean, it was partly because of advances in statistics. A lot of it was just because of World War II the experience, I mean, the US and the UK used statistical thinking in a way that the Axis powers did not, and it really helped. They call this operations research was the term of art for, for what they were in general doing. And, and a lot of economists were involved. Milton Friedman spent part of World War II help, helping, working at this statistics office at Columbia University, helping figure out things like how many pieces you want to score an artillery shell into. So to determine whether it blows up into lots of little pieces or just a few big ones. And it's a risk reward thing. If, if it's the big pieces, they cause more damage if they hit. If it's the little pieces, they um, are more likely to hit, but they cause less damage if they hit. And during, in the middle of the Battle of the Bulge, there were actually artis art gunnery officers who flew back to Washington to consult with Milton Friedman about what to do, which obviously gave him and other economists a certain confidence in what, what they could do with these tools. So there was that. There was the collapse of what had been for a while there in the first part of the century in the US, kind of the dominant economic tradition, which was, they called themselves institutionalists mostly. And really the, the guy now who most of us remember who was part of this tradition is John Kenneth Galbraith. But it's sort of this historical, literary way of looking at economics that's very appealing to journalists like me, but totally had no answers during the D Great Depression. Um, and, and so people started looking to people like John Maynard Keynes, who really was a more conventional economist who was just willing to have, have different ideas. And then the other part of it was just sort of political waves. There was this beginnings of a libertarian backlash against the New Deal and Great Society and all of these programs. And so these things all came together at Chicago and at MIT. And at MIT, the focus was on the statistics and, and the math and, and this idea that randomness was this really important concept to understanding pretty much everything that goes on in the world. And it is in so many things. And it it, it sort of came about as this way to tweak all these people who thought you could read stock charts and um, divine truth out of the fact that over the past 40 years, if you have a, like, head and shoulders is one thing, that, that that'll lead to some result afterwards. And what, what, a lot, what a lot of statisticians and economists in, from the 30s through the 50s were able to show is you could create all those same patterns with random processes. So there was that coming out of M MIT, which was basically market movements are akin to random movements. They're really hard to predict. Um, I mean, maybe you can, maybe some people can, but in general, there, there's no easy pickings in the stock market. That came together with Chicago, where everybody agreed with that, but, but gave it this more ideological freight, where it became this idea that, well, if markets were perfectly rationally reflecting all available information that's out there, then their movements would be random because they'd just be reflecting, I mean, news is random, so they would be reflecting changes in news, changes in risk assessment to a certain extent, but there would be no really easy to detect patterns in them. So the idea, a rational market would be a random market, 
Markets seem to be pretty random. Therefore, markets must be rational. And that led to this whole research project at Chicago of finding evidence that market, the stock market in particular, was, was really doing a great job of assigning prices to things. And I mean, one line of research was just looking at mutual fund performance and finding that mutual funds as a group didn't beat the market. And now that seems kind of obvious because mutual funds are such a big part of the market. And I think that was part of the explanation for why they didn't in the 60s either. But up, the idea w up to then, the stock market investing was dominated by individual investors. So the th thinking had always been, well, professionals are going to do better than them. And here are a bunch of highly paid professionals as a group, especially when you adjust for their volatility of, of their performance, they didn't do any better than the market. So that was one bit of evidence. Another bit was that um, prices reacted really swiftly to new information, often new information that hadn't been publicly disclosed. Markets could sniff it out. And again, these are all valid points, and, and, but it, it, it kind of came together into this all-encompassing view of the world that basically, I mean, the simplest way to put it is the price is right. And there actually was a professor at the University of Rochester, which was sort of University of Chicago junior in the 1970s, who would re start his classes by yelling, the price is right, the price is right. So that was the belief. Then there was this side element that seemed to come attached to all of this. And it doesn't have to be, and the, these don't have to go together. But I guess because all these people were saying that OK, markets are unpredictable. We can't predict prices. Nobody can predict prices. But they still wanted to give people something useful. What they said is, well, we can't predict price movements, but we can say something about the riskiness of a particular security. And, and for the most part, they, they just measured riskiness as, as volatility. I mean, they, they came up with more convoluted ways. And, and so that coming out of this, there, here's this bunch of people, young finance professors, from Chicago and MIT and increasingly elsewhere, Berkeley, Stanford, UCLA was a real hotbed as well, coming along in the 70s, who had this pretty clear view of how the world worked. And it was one in which there was no point in sneaking around trying to figure out which particular stock to buy and beat the market that way. There was a lot of point in owning stocks because over time they did lots of historical research that they pre had performed really well over time. And, and there was an explanation for that. It was because they were riskier over short periods and, and therefore over, over time that should reward you. And, and so that's my myth of the rational market. That's, it probably it peaked between about the, in, in academia between the late 60s and early 80s. And, and what sort of impact did it have? Well, the, I mean, the, some of the first things that came from these people were all these measurements of investing performance, that like the sharp ratio, alpha, et cetera. They're really big in the institutional investing world, but they find their way into other things like Morningstar ratings and stuff like that. The second thing was index funds, which I love index funds, and I think they're great things for lots of reasons. Um, and you don't have to believe markets are efficient or rational to think an index fund is a good idea. But I don't think index funds would have happened in the 70s. The first one at an institutional level was right around the corner here at, at what was then Wells Fargo Global Investors, became Barclays Global Investors. I don't know if it's going to become BlackRock Global Investors now or what, but it's going to be Global Investors. Um, and then Vanguard, Jack Bogle, invented, well, created the first index fund for retail investors a few years later. Option pricing models and the rise of derivatives markets. Again, it, it could have happened without this belief that prices are rational, but it makes a lot more sense to believe in an option pricing formula, which is based on existing prices of the underlying securities, if you believe those existing prices mean something. So that, that was led, led to that. In the law, there was huge transformation of, of thinking about corporate information disclosure and lots of other things because of this idea that markets are really efficient. And then in terms of deregulation, clearly this thinking played a role in it. But a lot of the financial regulations that fell apart in the 70s just fell apart because they, they weren't designed to cope with inflation. And, and you had things like Reg Q that said you could only pay whatever it was, 5% on a savings account. Didn't work very well when inflation was 10%. So I don't want to give too much credit to, the, to this myth in, in all the changes that happened. But the thing that definitely did happen 
starting in the 70s was this sort of financialization of American life where financial markets came to play a bigger role. People, instead of having their money in a bank, they had it in a money market account. And then increasingly, instead of having money in a pension, they had it in a 401k or in mutual funds. And again, these happened for lots of reasons outside of what a bunch of professors at Chicago said. But this whole idea that markets are these great rational things made it a lot more palatable, made this this popular thing. Now, what's interesting is right about in the early 80s, the first young professors looking to raise some hell started raising their hands. And Bob Schiller, who's now a familiar face with his floppy hair on TV and everywhere else, um, he, he's a Yale economist and prolific author. He wrote a paper that I think was published in 81. And it was sort of this raising your hand, yeah, but, and it was that, gee, it looked like the movements of stock prices were a whole lot more volatile than any, and, in, and the particular underlying thing he picked was the dividends that were subsequently paid, but lots of other people did research with just about every other fundamental variable you could come up with, and it was clear that the, the market's movements were much more volatile. <coughs> and then another guy who's sort of prominent these days, Larry Summers, who was a young economist at, at Harvard, well, initially MIT, then Harvard at the time, he did this paper sort of showing that, that it was impossible to tell a, a rationally unpredictable market from an irrationally unpredictable market unless you had, I think it was 150 years of, of data. Um, and so it was just basically the point that the, you know, maybe the market's randomness means prices are rational, but maybe not, nobody knows. Um, and so, as the years went by, more and more of these ideas that everybody was so sure about in the 50s and 60s got, got taken apart in, in academic finance. But the interesting thing that was going on in the wider world is the 1990s were happening. And in sort of the popular world, in the, pop, in the popular press, in corporate America and everywhere else, markets seemed to be working really well. And it wasn't just the fall of the Berlin Wall and all of that. It was that compared with, say, the German or the Japanese economies, which are these very bank-dominated, don't rely on the prices set in financial markets to determine all that much. They were struggling. The US and the UK were doing great. And so, and, and, and these fascinating things happened, like Larry Summers, who had been this huge critic of financial markets in, in the 80s, was suddenly working first at the World Bank, then in the Clinton administration, basically saying, well, you know, they're flawed, but they work a whole lot better than anything else. And, and, and I, I guess one way to look at it is Milton Friedman talked about, he had this famous line about monetary policy, like Fed decisions, they have effect on the real economy with long and variable lags. And I think the same, the same is true of, of ideas, intellectual ideas that come out of universities and elsewhere, is they're starting to have their impact on, on the popular culture years after they did on campus. And I, and I just, I mean, another classic thing in the 90s is before the 1990s, if people were talking about how big a company was, it was always its revenue or its profits. And those are both flawed measures, I'll agree, but in the 90s it switched completely to, you just talk about the market cap, and that tells you everything. And again, it is more all-encompassing, but as we learned in the, at the end of the 90s, it can give you some kind of weird measures of who's important and who's not. So, which brings us all to then kind of what went wrong. And I mean, clearly the, the simplest thing what went wrong is lots of people were given mortgages that there's no way they could have afforded to pay back unless housing prices kept rising. And the, the sort of more complicated, I mean, I was trying to come up with the one, one line explanation is that the markets for mortgage securities failed to price they failed to price risk, and, and what it turned out to be, and I think the problem that financial markets have is they're very good at differentiating like the riskiness of two different companies, of comparing two different companies, even different industries. What they're really bad at is, and this is understandable, is gauging the risk that they themselves create. And I think that's what happened in, in the mortgage markets is that the increasingly lax lending standards, and I mean, obviously some of this was brought on by regulatory decisions and, and the sort of obsession in Washington with people owning homes. But in the end, there were, for the most part, private investors around the world buying these mortgage securities. And they were buying them for way too cheap, given how risky they were. 
And the thing about that is that happens. It's happened again and again throughout history that these moments have come when people decide to just utterly ignore the potential riskiness of things and just look only at potential returns. And so you can't blame that on this myth of the rational market. What, what you can say, though, is that regulators and bankers and home buyers and a lot of other people were sort of singularly unprepared for what happened because of the dominance of this view of financial markets in which things ha always happen, prices always move for a reason, and price movements are calmly rational enough to be accounted for in pretty simple risk models. And that's, that's kind of where we are now. And I don't, again, I, this book I've written, is a, it's a story about where these ideas came from, where the challengers came from, and the sort of muddle we're in right now. I, I haven't written the answer, um, and I don't think anybody has it at the moment. One of the issues is just because markets are flawed and, and, and have these bubbles and, and panics and crashes, it doesn't mean that you're going to come up with some government regulators who do things better. Um, and and in, in fact, one of the problematic things I think about, especially banking regulation, is there was this movement over the past decade or two to have more flexible banking regulation, give regulators more leeway to do what they think, think thought was right, but they get caught up in all of the same craziness that markets do. So the, the, the two things that, that keep coming to mind is one, these financial market bubbles seem to cause a lot more damage when they're built on debt rather than equity. So you had the 90s um, tech stock bubble, which, I mean, it caused a lot of damage in the Bay Area, but it wasn't this economic disaster because for the most part, People were putting up money that they had no contractual right to get back. Um, they, were, they were willing to take that risk. Whereas with, with the uh, mortgages and housing, it was much more a debt-fueled bubble. And you know, people have contracts. They're supposed to get paid. Those break down. You start having all these big troubles in a financial system. So clearly, some limitation of leverage in boom times makes sense. I don't know what that limitation ought to be. And then, the, But the other obvious thing is, Markets are this, financial markets in particular, are this spectacularly efficient institution. Um, but it's a really bad idea to have a society that's entirely run by them. And I'm not saying we did exactly, but I, there were times in the late 90s when it, we seemed to be coming close. Um, it's, there's a reason why we have these obviously less efficient, but at least different bodies from charitable organizations to religious ones, to corporations themselves, to governments. Um, diversity brings better answers for the most part. And I think diversity of sort of the structure of economic institutions is part of that. So that's where I am now in this story. I would love to move it out to Q&A. Thank you. Yep. Ah. <laughs> okay, sure. So just a question on indexing and John Bogle. Um, I mean, there, there's a you know, notion that for an individual price, there's some irrationality and all kinds of behavioral things going on. But in, in aggregate, across a market where you have indexing for the, you know, basically the entire marketplace, with it, uh, what, what is your view in terms of the, the role of rational decision making or the fact that you basically are able to, to mask that or at least obviate some of the uh, behavioral consequences by indexing? Well, I, I love indexing. But I, the main reason I love it is because, well, first of all, because I've just realized over the past 10 or 15 years that, you know, part-time in, e I'm probably a bad investor, period, and doing it part-time in the evenings, I'm, I'm just crap at it. So I'm better off abdicating some of that and just saying, okay, I, I don't think the market's perfect, but I think it probably knows better than me most of the time. But the main reason is that indexing is cheap. And, and this sort of really basic equation that it was espoused by people like Bill Sharp and Jack Bogle in the 60s and 70s. So there's some identification with the efficient market, rational market idea, but it doesn't really have to go together. It's just that investors as a whole um, are going to trail the market by the amount of their costs. I mean, because investors as a whole are the market. Any sort of costs, that subtracts from what you're going to make. So if you're an investor whose costs are lower than the average costs, then you're doing better than most people. I mean, you're already doing better than most people, regardless of anything else. Um, 
I mean, the issues with indexing, I mean, obviously one issue would be if everybody indexed, then prices would be totally crazy because it would just, everybody, it'd be, and, and to a certain extent, the actual efficiency and rationality of markets is probably dependent on how many people believe in their efficiency and rationality. Because, and, and it is interesting that a lot of these ideas came about after this long period from the 30s through the 60s where there weren't many people participating in the stock market. Those who were participating were up until the early 60s were very heavily skewed towards value investors like Benjamin Graham. And they were making prices steadily more rational as, as that time went by. And if you looked back at the history of prices and were, you know, decided to stop at about 1932, it was this calm, steady, sen sensible movement. Um, but now I can't remember where I was going with that. <laughs> oh, well, I'll, I'll, come up to, I'll, I'll come up with the next question. Another question? issues with the uh, efficient, efficient market uh, theory. Something that enabled the crisis is, in America, people's um, comfort with sort of living on debt and yep. not saving enough. And so I was wondering if you could give your perspective on how that sort of came to be in our culture and what, um, what enabled that, you know, amongst like maybe mortgage securities or whatever it was. But. Well, I mean, I do think one, one reason is sort of related to this efficient market idea, which is that, I mean, we've had since the early, this, this kind of debt explosion, I mean, there'd been steadily rising in indebtedness from the 30s, but you could just call that kind of a correction of after people had totally freaked out about debt in the Great Depression. But starting in the early 80s, there was this pretty dramatic rise in um, consumer indebtedness. And it was clearly financed indirectly, but nonetheless, really, by people from overseas. First Japan, later this, this broader group of countries. And any time... There, you know, there've been books and books written about oh, the horrible indebtedness of America, and this is terrible. And I mean, two things would happen to discredit those people: one, the debt levels kept rising and we were okay, and the other was there was this argument: well, who are you to say you're smarter than these financial markets, which decide it's okay to give all these people this debt? So that's part of it. The other part, I mean, clearly there, it's, it's cultural experience. I mean, Germany because of the more recent and more searing experience it went through, first with inflation in the 20s and then with utter economic collapse after World War II, that seems to be a country much less comfortable with debt than we are. And, and I think, it, you know, something about the whole American way of doing things, it's about being hopeful and thinking things are going to turn out better, so we probably should have higher debt levels in a lot of countries. But I do think this idea that there's no... It, you can't have a wrong level of debt because this is what the market decreed. I do think that played at least a partial role in, in why no one ever tried to do much about it. Yep. Hey, uh, since we're a technology company and one that's obsessed with speed, I was wondering if you could say anything about high frequency trading and how that might affect rational pricing. Well, one of the interesting, happily I wrote my column this week about that, so. <laughs> I'm, no, but I'm not, I'm not totally, because um, I've been reading the stories for several weeks and just wondering, what, what are these people doing? Um, one of the things, because clearly if, if, if you see everything from this idea that markets are generally efficient and if you throw more resources at them, they're only going to get more efficient. Um, and, and that's what the people who defend high-frequency trading is. It's just creating more liquidity. It's lowering costs for everybody else. It's all a good thing. The, the one flip side of that, and, and the problem is the, the people who are concerned about it really can't bring up much of anything but vague fears, but there's clearly, when you introduce sort of a new level of speed to the market, and especially if other parts aren't at that rate yet, you, you end up with these pretty bad dislocations sometimes. I mean, 1987 crash was, among other things, very much, it seems to me, this interaction between these really fast Chicago futures markets in S&P 500 futures and the like, and the then still totally manual New York Stock Exchange. And so you had the futures prices adjusting really fast, and that suddenly sent all these floor brokers in New York to sell stocks. 
and, and it unleashed this panic because they didn't go together. So there's some level, some weird, I, I, I get the concern that some weird little thing happens in, uh, in the high frequency trading world could suddenly cascade out into the rest of, of markets and nobody would know how to handle it at first. Eventually we figure it out and it'll all be fine. The other thing is there's been these guys at the, it was initially done at the Santa Fe Institute and now I think the main guy who's doing it is Blake LeBaron at Brandeis. Um, they do these experimental security markets on computers and they create these agents who have pretty simple beliefs about, you know, they, they'll, they'll think something simple like stock prices are going to keep going up for a while. And then if, and then they adjust their beliefs if reality hits them in the face. And one of the really interesting things they've discovered with these markets is if their agents are sort of slow and take a while to adjust their beliefs to change market circumstances, you get markets that look pretty much like those out of financial theory that are like rational expectations markets. But you start speeding them up and having them change their minds really quickly and interact with each other, and you get more volatility and more fluctuation and more bubbles. And I don't know quite, so, so there's some level at which, at least in financial markets, not necessarily in the rest of life, but in financial markets, since everybody's sort of reacting to, the, anticipating what everybody else is doing, that extreme speed might bring you less efficient, less rational pricing. And I don't know the answer to that, but I, I don't think it's a crazy fear. I think, I think that could be true. Um, one of you guys back there. I have a question on your thought about uh, the wisdom of crowds. Uh, which is a book that gets a lot of credit at Google and is in many ways built into what we do. And so a book called The Myth of Rational Markets could be viewed as somewhat of an attack right. on the wisdom of crowds. And I'm just curious if you've read Wisdom of Crowds or just how you view that notion uh, compared to what, what you've written. I, I love that book. And, and um, Surowiecki came to my book party. Uh, but I think, it, I think it's only wrong. I think that concept is wrong to a certain extent in financial markets. I think if you're doing a prediction market where there's something's going to happen at the end of that period, um, you don't have any room for a bubble or other. You just, people make their predictions and it's really, if you have this diverse bunch of people making predictions, you get a better result than you would if you just asked one expert. So in that sense, the wisdom of crowds is absolutely right. I think the issue with financial markets, and it's, it's kind of funny, it's all coming, I mean, Keynes has this famous chapter of his general theory, which is this mostly unreadable book, but chapter 12 is this depiction of financial markets, and he's just describing how hard they are, because basically, you're anticipating what other people are anticipating that other people are going to do. And in the stock market, I mean, at least in, in some, in futures and option markets, there are expiration dates. So at a certain point, you come to, okay, it has to be this. But in stock markets, I mean, there are potential, ex people can take a company private, or there can be a merger. There, there are events that can happen that sort of, or a company can liquidate, that, that force the prices to come in contact with reality. But over really long periods of time, it can just be different people's opinions interacting with each other. And so, yeah, I think it's a totally valid concept. I don't think it applies in the same way to financial markets as, because basically financial markets are prediction markets about prediction, about predictions. Um, and, and that's different from just a straight prediction market. Back so let's assume that tomorrow policymakers uh, come around to your view of things and assume that markets are irrational. Well, what do you think that should imply for the structure of institutions, either in terms of controlling connectedness or size or kind of just overall risk levels and what, what we as a society should do to hedge? If I had the answer to that. Well, because obviously, I mean, one level within the Federal Reserve System, there's, there's this clear thinking now that up, up until Greens a year or two after Greenspan left, the idea was always, we know there are bubbles. We're not trying to claim that markets are always perfectly rational, but we can't identify them ahead of time, and so we'll just clean up afterwards. And that was sort of the Greenspan ethos the whole time he was head of the Fed. Now you're hearing a lot of voices at the Fed saying, well, actually, we can identify when debt levels are going up a lot, and we can do something about that. We don't necessarily have to say that prices are wrong in the markets, but there's something we can do to sort of lean against the wind in terms of um, the debt cycle. 
Beyond, in terms of interconnectedness of institutions, I wonder about that, because lots of people think, oh, if only we just had smaller financial institutions, this would all be fine. I think some of what, you, what we've seen about the way markets, financial markets behave is you can have lots of smaller institutions and they all lean in the same direction and that has the same impact as one big institution going bust. So I don't know that that solves as many things as a lot of people think. I, and you look at the financial systems that have survived this crisis best and I'm, I'm sure in some cases it's just the luck of who was regulating them, but Canada is this clear case of, of a system that it's like five big institutions, all of which do everything banking, stock brokerage, and investment banking, and they came through the crisis brilliantly. It was just there was more sense there of, of that idea of keeping debt from getting out of hand. There's one back here. Um, you mentioned value investing earlier, and uh, I've seen several interviews with Warren Buffett where he talks about how if he wants to buy a company, he looks at the business, he looks at the management, and he looks at the numbers, and he looks at the stock price, and if it, if the market is undervaluing the company, then he just buys it. Is it really that easy, or are you saying that the numbers are irrational, he shouldn't be trusting them like that? It, I mean, easy, I don't know, but I think it's that simple in the sense that that's one of the, I, I, I talked about Larry Summers and Bob Schiller, but one of the other really interesting things that happened in the late 80s and early 90s is this research by a lot of sort of hardcore orthodox finance professors, including Eugene Fama, the guy who authored the original efficient market hypothesis, who basically showed that over time, value stocks win. Value stocks outperform the market. And a lot of the, the sort of orthodox finance crew has struggled with that. And the, the explanation Fama gives is it's because somehow the value stocks are riskier, therefore they're gonna do better. I, I think an equally good argument is that value investing is riskier especially if you're a professional investor. Because if you're an agent for somebody else's money, then exactly when you should be staying out of stocks is when everybody wants to get into stocks. And exactly when you should be getting in is when everybody wants to get out. And the, the genius of Buffett is he set up this business where he's not dependent on anybody else's money. He just has all these companies that have nice cash flow and he gets to invest that however he wants. It doesn't matter what Berkshire Hathaway stock price is. Everybody can abandon him. He still has the cash to invest whenever he wants to. So I, I, I think the big reason value investing works is it, it's hard, especially for professionals. It's actually one of those things that might be easier for individual investors if they have the right mental <laughs> framework to, to be able to do. Anything else? Right here. Um, I spent a lot of time working with uh, Walmart, and they're betting the farm on these newly frugal customers. Um, and their hypothesis goes something like, you know, we've hit a permanent reset button. Um, people uh, will rethink value, will rethink the shopping experience, and certainly they're benefiting from that. Um, they say things like, uh, on the out, on the other side of this the recession, people will have to rebuild their nest eggs. They, um, you know, they'll they'll have a change mentality for a long time. So I, I'm just thinking of like, do you, do you believe that? Um, is a lot being written about that. And if you do or don't, what does that mean for the markets? And what does it mean for stocks like Walmart and others? Um, first of all, I do believe it, but everybody was saying the same thing, although probably some, to a somewhat lesser extent in the early 90s. Some, there, was, there was just a meeting the other day at Time, and someone was reminding us all that we had a cover story in like 1991 or 92 about the new frugality. Or, I, I think this was a bigger crisis. People are in more financial trouble. It's more likely to actually stick. And to use a little Google wisdom of crowds, I, I watch the little top 10 blog posts on time.com all the time, see how I'm doing. And there's this brand new blogger we've got who we haven't given any special publicity to or anything. He's some guy living out in the woods in New Hampshire, writes the Cheapskate blog. And it's like six out of the 10 top posts are invariably his posts. Just saying, you know, can you eat well on $50 a week and et cetera. So in terms of what that affects, I, I mean, I think at one level, companies that cater to that, to a very value-oriented audience do better. At the other level, it just seems to mean that you're not going to have, you're going to have this long period of indebtedness either shrinking or not growing very much at all. And if you look at 
over from 19, early 1980s until now, or especially until like five or 10 years ago, a lot of the rise in corporate profitability and in stock prices had to at least partly be related to people taking on more debt and spending more. And so if that's not there, that, that's something that weighs on, on financial markets overall, I would think. I mean, it's a healthy development, but it means that you don't automatically get a booming stock market out of it. Yep. Uh, I was interested in your views on loss aversion and how you think that skews uh, individual and institutional investment decisions. Um, that, I mean, interestingly, when I started writing this book, I thought it would be this history of first the rise of, of this hyper-rational view of markets and investing, and then its replacement by behavioral finance and behavioral economics and all these ideas like loss aversion that um, basically in, instead of just sort of rationally looking at all possibilities and, and, and weighing the risks, you're much more concerned about going back from your current state than, than, than weighing, weighing equally whether you go back or forward. Um, so clearly it affects individual decision making. And I mean, at the institutional level, I'm, I'm sure it's there. I think there's so many other interesting factors at the institutional level because of the added complication of being an agent and having customers that you're working for. The thing that's difficult, though, is finding finding ways finding ways that that's reflected in prices, and that's been one of the really interesting things that basically behavioral finance has brought, given all these great answers about how you could better structure a four hundred one k program or just how individuals should think about investing. It hasn't really delivered much at all on why prices do what they do, and that leads a lot of the kind of old guard finance people to say, "Oh, we won." And it's not really that. It's just it, we, we've got this model. We, there's no perfect, clear model that explains everything. They're just different explanations for different things. Anything else? Yep. Um, I was wondering uh, if you'd heard of the Austrian business cycle theory and uh, how much credence you put into it. Because a lot of the stuff you've been talking about touches on things that are kind of predicted by the Austrian school. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I gave some play to some Austrians in the book, and I thought at times about going much more in depth and, you know, spending Vienna in the 1880s, the rise of Austrian theories. And I, and I didn't for a couple reasons. One was that just if I'm looking at, this is basically a book about mainstream thinking, um, academic thinking about these ideas. And the Austrian ideas, I mean, there were moments, like when Hayek wrote The Road to Serfdom and his paper about information and prices, that they were very influential, but on the whole, they haven't been. And I guess the one other thing, and I don't think this is like the actual Austrians from way back when, but a lot of the people who call themselves Austrian business cycle theorists now, it strikes me as this very simplistic view of the world where everything is the Federal Reserve's fault. And my problem with that is we had financial crises and booms and busts before we had a Federal Reserve. So it, it just, and we actually created the Fed because we thought it would get us out of them. And clearly it hasn't, although they've been less frequent. So I don't know if it's a, you could argue that that's a problem because if you don't have them frequently, people don't learn how to deal with them and you end up with really big crises like this or the Great Depression. Whereas if you just let it happen every 10 years, you'd have less of a problem. So I don't, I mean, I, I'm fascinated with those those discussions, those arguments, it's something in the end I decided I would have to add another 200 pages to my book that I didn't have time for, so I didn't. But maybe some other time. Well, thank you very much, Great. Justin. Thank you. This was fun.